Assalamu alaikum, Mr. Khair. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Abraham Shreya. I'm a neurosurgeon, and we are transmitting live from uh, Farah Medical Campus here in Amman, Jordan. Our uh, topic for uh, this night is a posterior fossa tuberculous lesion. We will discuss the clinical, pathological, operative, and pathological correlation. So before we start, we have to know something about tuberculosis, which is a worldwide health problem. In developing countries, 110 to 165 cases per 100,000 population per year, while in developed countries it's much less. 2013 WHO report says that 9 million people developed TB and 2 million died of that disease. So tuberculosis has researched with the outbreak of AIDS and increasing frequency of other immune compromising conditions. There is resurgence of tuberculosis. It's no more of a forgotten disease. It is very much to, to, to remember it. If we look at these publications, old enough, 78, 89, 95, from Spain, only three patients developed TB in an HIV positive patients. And these are the papers. One patient in France, 93. So there is a global increase in the incidence of tuberculosis, both in the immunocompetent and in the immunocompromised. And unfortunately, 70% of patients are <coughs> below 20 years of age. Partially, that's because of multi practice. Yes, of course. Change the science about 20 years, less than 20 years. Yes, less than 20 years. Uh, so, why is that? Why do we have resurgence of TB in developed countries in the last 10 years? Immigrants, lots of camps, poor sanitation, poverty, immunosuppression, HIV, alcoholism. Aggressive chemotherapy, increasing age, and drug resistance, as Dr. Marwan Khoury just alluded to. Here in Jordan, the first hospital to treat tuberculosis was built in Karak, 1890. And we have to remember the Italian hospital, which was established in 1927. When you mention tuberculosis, everybody remembers Zeal Nelson Stein. But I'm sure we write it wrongly. It's not Nelson, it's Nielsen. Franz Ziel is a German bacteriologist. And Frederick Nielsen, also a German pathologist. They uh, combined this uh, Zeal-Nelson stain for tuberculosis. So I want to delete. So to give you an introduction about TB, uh, it's much better than I, Dr. Belvisi, please. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our international audience. Uh, one could talk about TB for hours and hours, if not days, but I'll try in 10 minutes to give you a capsule uh, of what we uh, need in clinical practice. So this is an image of a macrophage trying to swallow mycobacteria. Uh, they can swallow, but they can't kill it. And there are many, many mycobacteria. Mycobacterium TB is only one of them. And so when we say AFB positive, uh, we don't really mean mycobacterium TB. It could be any of the ones that you are looking at. Uh, to start with infection control issues, because that's what you need to know before you walk into that room with a suspected TB patient. Transmission is airborne, it's highly contagious, highly transmittable. If I cough at this end of the room, all of you will get um, TB infection or at least be exposed. Uh, so we like to isolate all suspected patients. We continue with isolation uh, for those that prove on chest x-ray to have open cavitary disease or vocal cord disease. Um, 
We put them in negative pressure rooms, otherwise known as air, airborne uh, uh, infection uh, isolation room. And here at uh, Farah Medical Center, we have two. Uh, one on the seventh floor, on the fourth. We have four rooms. Clara is our infection control officer. And two in ICU. So we are ready if we get a case of TB. And most hospitals don't. And in most hospitals may not have it. Um, right. And um, even given that negative pressure, we like the patients to wear a surgical mask. We ourselves walk into these rooms um, wearing special uh, masks, the, uh, the uh, N95 masks that filter 97.7% uh, of these particles. These particles are small. That's why they travel far in the air. Um, there are special respirators that we used to use at Mayo Clinic. They're still uh, used worldwide. And we used to do uh, fit testing for masks so that a person, uh, you fit it to your face to make sure that bacilli do not uh, enter and cause disease. And a contagious patient is a patient with a, a positive sputum for AFB. Uh, and contagiousness ends when that sputum becomes negative for AFB. Typically, it takes three weeks of effective therapy, about day 21 with day 22, for a smear to become positive. And we call that seroconversion. Uh, and that's when we can let a person out of isolation because they're not contagious anymore. The natural history of TB, we get exposed to empty bacilli. 90% of people clear the organism, 10% of people get infected. Um, of those, 90% go on to latent disease and 10% go on to progressive primary disease. Here's where bacillemia happens, and then uh, the bacilli spread to the liver, to the brain, and cause uh, illness later on. Um, secondary TB can be seen in reactivation of, uh, late, of latent uh, uh, TB infection and may cause cavitary and caseation uh, disease uh, and may also cause extra pulmonary disease. If there's pulmonary, there's extra pulmonary. So it could go to bone and joints. In the spine, uh, POTS disease, very famous. We see a lot of peritoneal. I've seen a lot of peritoneal TB uh, here in Jordan. Uh, renal, uh, biliary disseminated, plural, or CNS uh, disease. And th that brings us to our topic of the day. The CNS uh, TB can manifest in three forms. So it could manifest as meningitis, basal typically. Um, it could manifest as intracranial tuberculomas, masses in the brain, and it could manifest as uh, a complication of TB, which is hydrocephalus. There's also spinal TB, when we talk about CNS TB, and choroidal TB in the eyes. Uh, so as bacilli invade the blood and they go everywhere in the body, including the brain, um, scattered tuberculous foci are established in the brain, meninges, or adjacent bone, and the chance occurrence of one of those subendomal tubercles bursting uh, into a subarachnoid uh, space ends up in a case of meningitis. Um, reactivation happens in old age due to alcoholism, malnourishment, but also due to immune suppression at any age. So HIV positive patients, patients with malignancy, chemotherapy, steroids, um, and TNF-alpha medications, rheumatoid and the like. I won't go into the pathology as uh, Dr. Farsakh, I'm sure, will uh, discuss that. Um, a differential diagnosis of a CNS uh, tuberculoma would include fungal meningitis, which can cause focal masses, and we're talking about cryptococcus, as well as histoplasma, uh, blastomycosis, and coccidioidomycosis, which are endemic fungi uh, seen in certain parts of the world. Viral meningoencephalitis, herpes and mumps, Paramangial infections, partially treated bacterial meningitis, neurosyphilis, um, a forgotten disease, another forgotten disease, neoplastic meningitis, lymphoma or carcinoma, neurosarcoidosis, and neuroprosidosis. Shortest way to a diagnosis of TB meningitis, obviously, is CNS analysis. 
there's a high opening pressure, leukocytosis with lymphocyte predominance, low sugar, and high protein, more than 500 to 1,000. So that makes you suspect the case of TB meningitis. You send the um, AFP smear, and that's what the microbiologist will see. On a background of blue, you have bacilli that are fast, acid fast. They kept the acid, and so they kept the color red. Um, this has a high specificity and uh, uh, predictive value. Um, it, disadvantages is that you need in the sputum a lot of them, and I thought this was interesting for you, because in the sputum you need at least five to 10,000 AFBs per mil, so before you can see them. And that's why a more sensitive um, stain, the oramine rhodamine stain, uh, which requires a fluorescent microscope, uh, um, is sometimes needed. You see the best lie as fluorescent, orange or green against the black background. Very easy to diagnose. All this tells you is what? AFB positive, mycobacteria. It could be MTB or non-tuberculous mycobacteria. Um, so cultures, of course, the Lewinstein Jensen solid media is an uh, age-old solid medium. The problem is that these bacteria have a slow generation time. They are um, slow to divide. Typically, bacteria divide quickly. You know, two, four, eight, sixteen, blah. But here, it takes almost a whole day for it to divide. And so cultures take a long time on solid media, two to six weeks. Uh, they take uh, a shorter time in liquid media, two to three weeks. And after that, the lab will call and say we have a growth of an acid fast bacillus. Uh, is it MTB? Well, we can't be sure. We have to do more testing to confirm that it is TB. And I only stress this because through 20 years of practice, I've seen many, many um, misdiagnosis or confusion uh, about interpreting initial lab results. Molecular diagnostics uh, are here to help. They are rapid uh, and they, you can look for the nucleic acid with amplification of NAD, speciate, look for resistance genes. The gene expert can tell you what the mycobacterium is, or at least if it is mycobacterium TB, and if it's resistant to rifampin or not, which is a key anti-TB medication. Uh, you can get all that in two hours. That's medicine in the modern age. To wait for six weeks for something to grow is totally, yeah, and you're ridiculous in this day and age. To say the least. You can do that on the sputum sample immediately. Yes, you can do that on the sputum sample immediately, my one says. Thank you. And PCR, we can also do that on the sputum sample on uh, CSF, and that's available to us. Yes, yes, it's available in Jordan, yes. Um, so we routinely now ask for TB by PCR from the CSF when we try and get it. We can do it on uh, pathological specimens. Um, we, uh, the molecular technology can help you, um, can help tell you if there's uh, resistance, for example, INH or rifampin. But one alluded to the problem of multidrug resistant TB, and there's also extensive resistant TB, uh, which we'll talk about a little more. Uh, towards the end. So you use your physical exam, skin test, I'll jump to it. This is old age, the PPDs, tuberculin mental, uh, TB skin test. So you bring the patient in, you do the intradermal injection uh, of the uh, um, TB uh, mixture, which is a really old, old mixture. It's a mixture of many antigens. Uh, but if the patients um, are macrophages and, and uh, inflammatory cells have seen TB before, they will produce interferon and they will attack and form a mini granuloma. And you see that as uh, induration at the site of injection. You want to read this at 24 to 72 hours. So that's two visits for your patient. Uh, so they may come back, they may not. Um, and so um, I prefer the IGRA, which is interferon uh, gamma release assay. Uh, where you take the patient's memory T cells and um, you incubate them with TB antigens in the lab, in vitro, outside the body. And if these cells had seen that, those antigens that remember, because interferon, you can measure that and you get a number. And you can get this out in a day. It's more expensive, but 
you know. Good medicine is expensive medicine. Um, then we move on to radiology. So you see the cavitary uh, disease. CNS, these are all examples of tuberculomas. They may have, uh, you might have one tuberculoma or more, you may get calcification. Um, and uh, Brahim has helped me consolidate these slides, I see. And you can also get hydrocephalus uh, and um, suspect TB. <coughs> Moving on to therapy. So you want to use first-line agents that have good penetration into the uh, CSF. Um, examples be isomizer, rifampin, brisinamide, and fluoroquinolone, moxifloxacin, or levofloxacin. Uh, Second-line agents are available in case of resistance. These are old, old, archaic drugs that we hate to use because they have many, many side effects and they have to be injectable. Uh, so we don't use them except when we're forced. Um, luckily, the pipeline has produced some newer anti-TB medications. Uh, Bidaquilin, uh, approved for TB, TB treatment. Linazolid covers TB, and there are some more uh, coming our way. Uh, principles of therapy, intensive therapy for two months, just like pulmonary TB with four drugs. And then uh, a continuation phase of two drugs for at least nine months. You want to do at least a year with CNS TB and sometimes even more, a uh, year and a half or two, depending on the situation and the susceptibility of the, uh, the bug. And so this is where we get in trouble because in 20 years, I've yet to see a lab report that tells me sensitivity of a TB in Jordan. It just, I don't see it. Uh, Ministry of Health will say, oh, send it to us, we'll do susceptibility, but which, you know, well, fine, welcome, we're happy to do it. I've never seen that report come back. So I don't know what happens there, but um, um, we really do need that susceptibility data to base our treatment on choice and duration. So we can't say anything about the uh, residents in Jordan. Is MDR TB a problem in Jordan? It's not a great problem in Jordan, but um, as it happens in pre medical practice in Jordan, we see many patients that come from other countries where MDR, so MDR is a problem. A problem. Let's say, let's say in regions of the Arab world where wars have taken ravage and um, broken down the healthcare system, such as Iraq, um, yeah, Yemen, Libya. Uh, and we've had patients from these countries, and so that's where one would suspect the case of MDR. Actually, one would make an argument this is where you'd expect surgeons of TB, not necessarily MDR. Absolutely. 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 Uh, amongst many other uh, terrible infections like cholera, uh, well, the biggest outbreak in history uh, ongoing in Yemen. And nobody mentions anything all that. I'm glad that you just brought this up to our international. Yes. Um, and it, survival depends on that resistance. If you look at this slide, you see that um, a fully sensitive patient with a fully sensitive TB has better chance of survival than a patient that has, for example, uh, mono resistance to streptomycin or INH or uh, both. Steroid use, we like to use steroids in the CNS to decrease the inflammatory component of the illness. There's the infection and then the inflammation. Uh, I'm not gonna go through this, but we almost always use steroids uh, treating TB meningitis. Uh, I'll just kind of close up with challenges to TB eradication. Why have we not eradicated this age-old disease? One, there's lack of protective uh, vaccine. The vaccine we have is ancient, ancient. Uh, just a collection of uh, antigens, and uh, so we need a, a vaccine that stands up to modern um, um, scrutiny and gives us protection. The BCG protects for the first year. We typically give it to our infants to protect them from TB meningitis in the first year. There's no evidence that it continues to protect uh, much thereafter. Uh, inadequate and slow diagnostics, lack of effective modern anti-TB medications, the MDR problem referred to, and the HIV epidemic, of course. And so when we have better diagnostics, uh, we're able to improve the survival. If we have better, better uh, treatments, we'll improve the survival even further. If we have both, we'll improve it almost to an extra seven, uh, quarter of a million people uh, surviving TB each year. 
This is the incidence of TB around the world with concentration in Africa. This is the incidence of MDR TB with concentration in the former countries of the USSR, Russia, and the neighboring countries. It's estimated that half a million people around the world have MDR TB. And so TB care reimagined would be a situation where we'd have a new vaccine, be able to rapidly triage patients, rapidly diagnose patients with mild cough and the like, give short, uh, effective treatments. Currently, studies are uh, ongoing for bedaquiline, predominant moxifloxacin and perzinamide, uh, monitor adherence through electronic uh, means, and support patients. And hopefully, we'll see this uh, soon. And so, with this, I will stop and give the mic back to uh, Professor Brian. Thank you. So, it's a worldwide problem, and uh, we face it, and we have to learn more about it. The organs affected, as uh, it is said, lungs first, lymph nodes, osteoarticular joints, spine, abdominal, intestine, like enteritis and peritonitis, genital kidney with their kidney and uh, urinary bladder, and of course, our topic for today is the CMS. So, this is pulmonary TB, pyema, as you mentioned. <laughs> and this is paper from Taiwan, Resurgence of TB. We have to admit that TB is no more uh, gone, it's there and it is vigorous. Lymphadenitis in the neck, osteoarthritis in the knee, testicular tuberculosis, ocular tuberculosis can affect any organ in the eye, any layer of the eye, iritis, iritis, anchylitis, vitritis, retinitis, choroiditis, vasculitis, optic neuritis, inophthalmitis, and panophthalmitis. The commonest in the eye is uveitis, and the commonest of the uveitis is not the anterior or intermediate, it is the posterior uveitis. <coughs> it's very common in KSA, Saudi Arabia, 16%. Well, in USA, it's 1%. But look at this paper from Boston, USA, of this ophthalmic experience in TB sanatorium in Boston, 10,000 patients, 15% intraocular. But that's a long time ago, 1967. Uh, intraocular tuberculosis in this paper, 2010, again from USA. Tuberculoma, look at the scar of the tuberculoma. Again, tuberculoma choroiditis, exudates and everything. And this is a very nice paper, 2013, I think from okay. India, and it is about 1,000 consecutive HIV positive. Remember, we are saying TB resurgence with HIV epidemic. 1,000 patients who had HIV, and look at the ocular manifestations. Case of endophthalmitis from Japan, developed country. Uh, another one, again, from Malaysia, with choroidal tuberculoma. pan 2016, from Thailand. Post-cataract endothermitis due to TB. Post-surgery from Mumbai, India. They can mimic tumors, intraocular tuberculosis, mimicking retinoblastoma. This was thought to be an retinoblastoma when they inoculated the eye as TB. Spinal tuberculosis, and I'd like to call upon Dr. Zayed Zabi to tell us about it. Thank you, Dr. Brahim. Um, uh, Dr. Brahim gave me 10 minutes to talk about um, spinal TB. And um, actually, because I mean, um, uh, all uh, things related to pathology, physiology, anatomy, and so on has been discussed. So I'm going to tell you about some rare cases of spinal TB uh, and some tracks in treatment of uh, TB spine, including the surgical and uh, medical. Uh, so when Okay. Uh, well, spine is number one actually site of uh, hematogenous osteomyelitis in adults and third um, uh, and most common site for all age groups. Uh, 
Um, and the organism is nothing, actually. The environment is uh, everything, as uh, Pasteur tell. Environment means original injury, original organ, host's ability to neutralize bacteria, and the vascular environment uh, surroundings, uh, hospital, staff, and so on. Um, well, um, spinal infection, either post-operative, like post discrepitum spinal fusions and instrumentations, or acute pyogenic um, in childhood, adolescent, and adults, and the chronic uh, granulomas like TB. Uh, this case actually is extremely rare. This is the only case I have seen. Is this HIV uh, bone or spine? This case actually, this patient called Miftah, he came from Libya. He is one of the victims of the injecting um, HIV virus to uh, children by uh, a nurse from, uh, I think, Bulgaria or something like that. So it's um, extremely rare and we could not actually do nothing for him. He died a few days after I have seen him. Um, well, actually, because of, I mean, um, the relation between the vascularity of the spine um, so, uh, and the, the, the related organs or neighborhood organs, uh, the hematogenous uh, is coming through uh, this spread, I mean, in spinal artery, via spinal artery, and uh, drained via paravertebral venous plexus, and also can spread directly, or, I mean, from uh, surrounding organs. Uh, TB spine is usually, not all the times, is affecting the disc and the neighbor uh, vertebra. So when you see destruction of the, of the disc and uh, surrounding, uh, or I mean the vertebra above and vertebra below, it's TB unless otherwise proved. Um, um, while in Troata, the arterial system in, um, in the uh, spine is uh, responsible for most of the cases of fiction. It's rich blood supply, and penetrate the end plate in 180 degrees um, uh, to the uh, metaphysis. And there's a special venous system uh, of patsum called patsum. It's from pelvic and abdomen, vertebral arteries to thorax, valveless, the, the veins are valveless. So it's direct, I mean, uh, invasion from the surrounding organs, whether from the intestine or from the uh, lungs uh, to the, um, to the uh, dorsal spine. Of course, you know, medical treatment, most of the cases underwent surgery or CT-guided biopsy were found to be mixed. Almost all the cases I have seen, it's not only TB bacteria, but it's mixed with another bacteria, especially in the last two decades. I, you know, probably the TB has disappeared for some time from, the, from many countries and reappeared again because of probably low immunity, HIV, and so on. But most of the cases we have seen is uh, mixed with another bacteria. Uh, of course, that's why culture analysis is mandatory before starting anti-tuberculosis and antibiotics. Uh, um, the operative treatment, the approaches, is different according to the uh, vertebra affected. I mean, in cervical and dorsal, uh, the anterior approach is is um, is much better, of course, and there is severe uh, when there's I mean there's severe instability like this one, and also um, uh, 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 if you go from posterior, it's uh, there's high incidence of uh, cord ischemia and causing paralysis, and I've seen actually many cases of treatment of infection in the spine, the vertebral bodies, and disc. Uh, going from bilaminectomy and so on, and trying to move the cord to reach the, uh, uh, to the uh, pathology. So it's hard. And why they go from posterior? Because anterior usually is not easy for uh, most of the uh, spine surgeons. Um, in, in case of lumbar vertebra, uh, it's completely different because, I mean, you can mobilize the dura in, in lumbar vertebra, especially the lower lumbar vertebra. Um, this is a case actually, like this one. This is Rasha Mahdi. Uh, she came from Yemen, okay? She is uh, around 15 or 16 years old. And her father is a professor in medical school in, in Aden, in Aden. And uh, she has actually um, destruction of the, as you see here, of the vertebra, the disc and the vertebra above and below. And she was actually uh, paraparitic and almost uh, paralyzed of the lower limbs. 
one of the best things around uh, about um, TB spine that I mean, if there's weakness of the lower limbs or I mean paraparesis or something, like that, it improves dramatically after. Uh, you do surgery, if you do correct surgery like this one, we have done anterior approach, you put, we remove the whole pathological vertebra here and replace it by this cage. At that time, actually, this is long time ago, 1998, um, at that time we did not have the screws for the dorsal spine, only the lumbar spine, so we fix it by hooks from the posterior. So this, she has anterior and posterior in the same position. And she improved completely. And she came actually after six, seven years with her father. Um, she's married and um, in, uh, normal life. Um, I select them in some cases here. If this dorsal, sorry, you can let me show you. I feel like there are a lot. Okay. Ah, this is actually. Um, ah. um, probably we missed the slide, the pathology. This is cervical. And again, we go from anterior, we remove the whole uh, body of the vertebra here, and, um, and uh, fix it from posterior also. By At that time also, we did not have the plates to fix, uh, I mean, above the uh, cage. Um, this is interested, Saleh Jawabra, he came from Palestine, actually, as old man, 70 years old man, and he has, as you see here, abscess anterior to the body of the vertebra, and this destroyed the discs, vertebra above, vertebra below, and it caused for him also uh, almost paraplegia, weakness of the both legs, I mean, because it's level three, L3 is not. So we came, we go from uh, anterior, we remove it, and at that time, actually, we did not have cages in Jordan, so we remove it, and we did for him uh, posterior fixation. Um, uh, we put, uh, as alternative here, you piece here, as you see it, this is a, a rib. We excise the rib and put it here. And this, again, patient improved dramatically. Um, this is very difficult case because it takes destruction of the whole L5. And if somebody tell you that, I mean, TB can destroy the bone, only the disc and the bone above and below, this is not good. Because, as I told you, um, uh, all these cases were mixed bacteria, not only TB, but TB mixed with another bacterium. And this is actually uh, difficult. Why difficult? Because, I mean, to go anterior, as you know, the anatomy is very difficult. I mean, uh, iliac arteries, iliac veins, and so on. So, and uh, plexus for uh, uh, nerve plexus. So, again, we remove it from anterior with the help of vascular surgeon, and we fix it from posterior, from S2, because we have to remove part of the S1, and also remove the whole thing and put. Uh, um, like again, this is, of course, Maryam Aburupa. This is the only Jordanian patient of the uh, series. Uh, again, very beautiful girl, this one. She married uh, and she has children also. And um, we prefer surgical uh, treatment rather than to stay on antituberculous drugs for a long time. Why? Because sometimes there's, I mean, the stronger indication, sometimes there's cold abscess you have to do drain it as any abscess. And there's, when there's neurological symptoms and signs, and where there's failure of medical treatment, the advantages avoid permanent neurological complications and fast recovery and antibiotics according to the culture and sensitivity. And yes, thank you. Thank you. Can I? Yeah, my name is Asim <laughs> so we'll come to the topic for tonight, the cranial TB, how can tuberculosis affect the brain and surroundings, can affect the meninges, which is the commonest, 78%, can cause tuberculomas, masses in 30-20%, and in 10% or less, you can have tuberculous abscess. So this is tuberculoma in military TB. This is meningeal enhancement in form of meningitis. And again, the basal uh, meninges. So meningitis is exudative. And especially in the basal system, it can cause lots of adhesions. <coughs> Look at this and the basal meninges. So that's why they develop hydrocephalus, because it will block CSR pathway. And hydrocephalus in TB could be communicating, could be non-communicating, obstructive or non-obstructive. 
various cases of hydrocephalus, secondary to tuberculosis. And because of the meningitis, you will get a process called endarteritis obliterans, where you get the pathology inside the arteries and they will close. So middle cerebral here is, is closed by TB. And this would lead to infarctions. Look at this. Infarctions could be unilateral, could be bilateral, secondary to tuberculous meningitis. So it can kill. And we mentioned that 2 million people die annually out of TB, mainly if they develop CNS infection. So this is the pattern of infarcts in the basal ganglia from India. You can see bilateral infarct. Again, infarctions from South Africa. South Africa, by the way, they have one region, I think it's in the north. It is the largest number of patients with tuberculosis. And we know that they have HIV positive patients as well. <clears throat> Cranial nerves can be affected because of the basal arachnoiditis. This paper again from India. So you can see why we are affecting here. You can affect the fourth nerve, you can affect the third nerve, and here you can affect the seventh nerve. And this is how the imaging would look like. A paper from Portugal, hydrocephalus, basal arachnoiditis, everything. <clears throat> the same thing, hydrocephalus. Or you may get cerebritis. Cerebritis is just inflammation, kephalitis kind of thing. So you get a stage of cerebritis, like this. And then this may develop into tuberculoma, a mass, which could be single or multiple. Multiple small or giant, like this. Multiple small. It could be giant like this. And with this, you send it to a new uh, uh, report, and people would say the first thing is parasagittal meningia. Well, parasagittal lesions are so many, not only the parasagittal meningiomas. <coughs> Various kinds of tuberculomas, small and large. <coughs> Look at this here. You may miss it for a glioma. And they can get calcified. We are forgetting about the value of a skull X-ray. No more people are asking for skull X-ray as a preliminary test. It can give you a lot of clues, especially from the cellular area. So they can get calcified. And they get what they call target sign, just like the target because of the calcification, whether CT or MRI. And here again, another tuberculoma. You can get extra dural, epidural tuberculoma. This is from Paris. I looked deeply. The patient is not French. He was of Moroccan origin. <clears throat> and the use of uh, spectroscopy in these cases. Uh, tuberculomas can also be in a very unusual locations like intraventricular, subracellar. And this was in the cerebellum antenna angle. The commonest lesion in the cerebellum antenna in, in the frequency is uh, vestibular schwannoma, meningioma, epidermoid. But people forget about the other manifestations of other lesions in that area. <coughs> Again, subacellular area. This is the multiple tuberculomas that can develop into an abscess, 10% of cases. So, tuberculous abscess. And I also looked into the literature. In USA, in these early years, they mentioned three patients who developed abscess secondary to HIV. Pictures of various abscesses. Look at this. You can say this is bacterial abscess. I mean, other than TB, etc. It can be multiple. And this is a very interesting paper from India, from my friend Atul Gul, uh, flare-up of tuberculous abscess following stereotactic aspiration. I do not, I've never believed in just aspiration of an abscess. I believe in accession of the pus and the capsule. The capsule contains the organisms and the, uh, the uh, you have to get out the rid of it. Again, brain abscesses in AIPS patients, unusual places. Parasagittal. 
multi-resistant drugs cause these again from USA 2003. Looking in, into the paper, he is a patient from Yemen. This is a paper from Mexico and also in immunocompromised and immunocompetent. So this is in immunocompetent from Mexico. Look at these abscesses. You can have extradural abscess with osteomyelitis of the bone, like this, extradural or subdural, like this. And again, subdural empyema like this, in an infant with osteomyelitis from Turkey. So now come with our presentation for today, which is gonna be easy now for you. Uh, this is a patient, 31 year old from Yemen. Uh, he came with a three months history of vertigo and unsteady gait. And then also he complained of headaches with diplopia and nausea. Nothing in the past history, just appendix long time ago. And I wanted to say this because there's no history of TB in his family and he had no TB in his body anywhere else. So this was a primary tuberculosis without pulmonary TB in him or in his family. Mitral signs were okay, he was not feverish. General examination was normal. Last book on scale 15 over 15. He had sickness mostly. He was closing his right eye because when you see double vision, you try to close one eye to see one vision. So that's why he has this appearance. His facial nerve was intact. Uh, he had tandem walking impaired. He had wide gait, he had imbalance. He had the power in his upper and lower limbs were normal right and left. That's the patient and we do this photo to say that he does not have pyramidal weakness. If the patient raises his hands like this and there is no drift, this means that he has no weakness. Very quick examination. We keep telling nurses, glass of common scale, you can do it in one minute. So easy. Investigations, just X-ray, ECG normal, CBC normal, leaning time normal, kidney functions, electrolytes normal, liver functions, we have just elevated GGT, mild elevation of ALT. Imaging, and I would like to call upon Dr. Ahmad Atami to tell us. Uh, this is the axial view post contrast for the same patient. If you look carefully, before starting to describe this uh, image, there are three things you have to look as a radiologist before interpreting the uh, image or to analyze the image. First of all, you have to look for the basal system and even if there is any enhancement. Second one, you have to look. Second, you have to look if there is any uh, communicating hydrocaf. And third one is secondary vas uh, hemorrhagic infarction or infarction due to vasculitis. Uh, if you look carefully in this T1 uh, post contrast, there are multiple basal cystic enhancing nodular enhancing lesion. Also, we have uh, in the right cerebral hemisphere multiple miliary enhancing lesion. The lesion causing some mass effect upon the fourth ventricular stay. This is patent. Next one. This is the two axial view for the same patient. If you look carefully, there is a large hyperintense mass lesion involving almost all the right cerebellar hemisphere extending uh, into the right uh, cerebellar bed angles and reaching the right CP angle causing the midline and causing some compression into the fourth ventricle. I can't see the ventricle if there is any hydrocast. Next one. This is both contrast also. You can see this is the enhancement of leptomeningeal enhancement and some uh, mediary enhancing lesion with a cerebral atmosphere also in the CB angle. Uh, the same, you can see here the compression into the sylvian aqueduct and the extension of the tumor uh, to the left side. This is uh, also T2-weighted axial view for the same patient. We can see the same findings, also this extension into the brain stem. 
this is flare sequence. Flare sequence is very important to diagnose the uh, lip to meningitis because in flare sequence, terrible uh, flare sequence, uh, there is no suppression of the CSF because there is a proteinous material within the subarachnoid space. Uh, this is very diagnostic. Next one. This is coronal view. We have some <coughs> prominent of the frontal horns of the lateral ventricles. This is the region enhancement of the meninges, uh, medially enhanced region within the cerebellum for ventricle. Also coronal view, the same findings. This is a spectroscopy, single voxel spectroscopy sometimes can help because it's a inflammatory process and we look for the lactate. Lactate, this is the, the spectroscopy. This is the part, <coughs> this is PPM, part per million, and this is the concentration. If you look carefully here, we have this uh, big lactate at the 1.4. If this is to know if it's a lactate or it's a lipid, because lipid is very close to, to the lactate, it's about 1.3, this is 1.4. We have to do TE 280 and then 150 to invert T lactate. The next one. If you see this is <coughs> inverted, which means this is lactate. Well, lactate is increased in inflammatory process. But this uh, <coughs> the choline and A is not specific for this region. Also, as I mentioned before, you have to look for MRA in order to see if there is any vasculitis and secondary infection. If you look carefully, this is the uh, <coughs> right uh, vertebral artery, left vertebral artery, basal artery, posterior cerebral artery. This is the internal <coughs> cerebral artery, canal, this is the middle cerebral artery, middle cerebral artery, anterior, anterior cerebral artery. Grossly, there is no any significant narrowing. Uh, vein, vein mm -hmm. uh, also, the uh, TB can cause superior sinus thrombosis, and we have to look carefully. If you look carefully, this is the superior sinus, this patent, this sinus, and this is the uh, vein of gallium, and also we have the uh, transverse sigmoid, transverse sigmoid. Grossly, there is no evidence of superior sinus thrombosis. To summarize our findings, <coughs> there is a hypointensity in T1 weighted, hyperintensity in T2 weighted, and enhancing aging within the basal system, which is very important. Uh, the differential diagnosis in this regard, the first of all, you have to put in your mind is this uh, is the uh, sarcoid, inflammatory sarcoid. Also, we have infection meningitis. Or you have to keep in mind also if there's a history of rheumatoid arthritis can cause this pattern. Thank you. So we did surgery for this patient, and uh, some of you may ask, why did you do that? It looks like TB. I will give you the answer later. Differential diagnosis of such a lesion. Remember the lesion again, keep it in your mind and compare it with the lesions I'm gonna show you and tell me if there's, there is any difference. Pedaloblastoma, four types. Some people put it into five types. Similar or not? Very much so. Cerebellar metastasis. Cerebellar metastasis, whether from melanoma or others, hemangioblastoma, infiltrative medalloblastoma, ependymoma, hamartoma, they all look like our region. Ganglioma, juvenile astrocytoma, uh, NF1, atypical teratoid, dysplastic ganglioma, astrocytoma, and most of these are my cases. So they have been histologically proven. Cerebellar infarction, cerebellar tuberculomas is on the list, medalloblastoma, cerebellar encephalomalacia, Lermit Douglas disease. So, so many differential diagnoses. And because we have a patient who is progressively deteriorating with 
uh, building hydrocatalysts, sitting out one sea, and shift of the fourth French chicken, we have only one option, is to firmly diagnose by either biopsy or by excision. Thank you. So what is an oncologist doing in a TB session? Well, this is exactly why we're here. Um, these are actual cases. This is not just a mental exercise of what could this be. And the difference is tremendous in, in the approach to all of these. Medalloblastoma as, as top of the list, after, after total excision, if possible, uh, the mainstay of therapy would be radiotherapy and then plus minus platinum-based chemotherapy and the treatment would be potentially curative if dealt with properly. Now, metastasis in this region, I, it cannot be emphasized this enough and you'll miss that because nobody bothered to looking for a primary on this patient and nobody did a proper breast exam and a decent physical examination to rule out this. Uh, in a patient where you could have easily dealt with melanoma because nobody bothered to check the skin properly and examine the, chair, the, the skin properly, including hidden areas between toes, uh, below the knees, etc., etc. Now, uh, ependymoma would be treated after surgery with, uh, again, with platinum-based uh, 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 chemotherapy after radiotherapy. The chemotherapy of ependymomas and, and melanoblastomas tend to be similar. Now, ganglionomas, the mainstay would be would be really surgery. Astrocytomas it depends upon the grade of the astrocytoma, but after complete surgery, they may be followed by radiotherapy or alternative based therapy or both. Cerebral tuberculoma, we mentioned that. We mentioned the possibility of sarcoid being this, and the, the approach would be radically different, and sarcoid would disappear if somebody just gave them steroids to hold that. Infarction and cephalomalacia would actually have, uh, um, and uh, uh, will have no implications from an oncological perspective. These are actual cases. Now, the other reason that I really have to emphasize we tend to forget that we are living in an endemic area for TB. And TB can flare up with steroids, it can flare up with chemotherapy, it can flare up with almost everything we get, regardless of whether they're directed to NF or no. And regardless of the MDR uh, TB instance in the world, we are living in an endemic area for TB and we should not forget these lesions. Okay. Okay. We did a few consultations. We consulted the pharmacologist, Dr. Mayim Sadat. I'm here. Uh, good evening. So, obviously, uh, from uh, the uh, notes, uh, TB did not affect the eye. Everything is okay. Uh, it affected the sixth nerve palsy because the uh, right sixth nerve uh, passes through the cerebral pontine angle and there's hydrocephalus. So uh, any of these could affect the sixth nerve palsy. Uh, also, there's direct affection of the sixth nerve palsy. Usually these patients come with diplopia, it's a vertical diplopia, which increases towards the uh, side of the lesion. So he sees two uh, here, he sees less separation and probably this is one, this is one. Uh, and sometimes they close one eye to see better, otherwise they will feel dizzy, they might uh, vomit, they will have headache. Thank you. Uh, at that time, Dr. Jamal Sharif was in charge and he announced the patient to be fit for general anesthesia. And in this case, like other cases of cerebral I do them in, in the sitting position. Uh, Dr. Faraz, are you around? Professor Baish is the chief resident, chief anesthetist in uh, in Farah, and he is with us uh, in many many cases of sitting position. Thank you, Dr. Ibrahim, for the very interesting cases over and over again, and they are challenging as well. Dealing with a patient uh, coming with TB is extremely serious condition and extremely challenging for the anesthetist. Uh, the implications for anesthesia can be divided into three major classes. The first one is the patient general condition in general, because this could be pulmonary and extrapulmonary, as Dr. Montasar Bilbisi has stressed out. So the patient could be symptomatic, they could be really sick patients. The other is that the universal uh, precautions for being infected uh, uh, as uh, healthcare providers dealing with a patient with TB. 
The third one is the most has the most serious implications for, and this is especially for patients who had received TB treatment, especially rifampicin, isoniazide, and so on, because these um, drugs actually has some very serious effect on the liver. Uh, so you, we, we as anesthetists have to be extremely aware of the liver function test because rifampicin, for example, and isoniazide are uh, liver enzyme inducers, especially cytochrome P450. And this has very, some very serious effect on the anesthetic drugs because these patients have very high consumption of opiates and they have very high consumption of uh, uh, muscle relaxants, especially aerocoronium and bicoronium. And dealing with a sitting position uh, patient, these patients are on a continuous muscle relaxant infusion. And usually we use, uh, in most patients in the arable, because we have different pharmacokinetics and pharmacogenetics, we use a lower dose than uh, the European and the uh, American population. But for these patients, we have to be extremely cautious because if any movement would cause tetraplegia, in the operation. So we have to be aware that these patients who have tuberculosis, they have very high consumption of muscle relaxants and very high consumption of opiates, especially due to the induction of liver enzymes, especially cytochrome P450. The other one, the other uh, is that some of these drugs can cause serious hepatitis. And if these patients are um, diagnosed with, uh, uh, with hepatitis, the mortality could reach five, between five and 10%. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm proud to say that we are one of the most experienced people in certain position in the world. I'm saying this in a loud voice. We are one of the experts doing this kind of surgery in the sitting position. The patient is sitting and I'm also sitting. The one who really tears is the scrub nurse and the assistant. <coughs> So this is the view you want to see, sitting position. We're looking from behind. This is the right cerebellum, this is the left cerebellum, and we'll be going here. And we go here, the transverse fascia between the foliae of the cerebellum. Not this way, because you'll damage lots of foliae, you go this way. And we get the extensive concept, spilling out everything about patient and the complications. And we'll see the surgery in another video. It's going to be quick uh, film, so don't worry. So as I said, patient is sitting. This is midline, this is the left side, this is right side, this is sustained magna. I'm doing the transfer section, I'm going into the tissues. Here I am. You could tell this is abnormal because it is a tumult. It is just a, Elastic, and this is not the normal brain. Normal brain is not. So we take as much as we can of that region. In the first minute we got the specimen, we sent it for a frozen, and we continue. Again, if I'm there, I'd like to take as much as the region as, as I can. Is it well encapsulated? No. So this is the cavity left. And we do hemostasis, we put this hydrogen peroxide thing, which would uh, coagulate any small vessels, and it is, uh, kills anaerobic organisms. And then we put surgicin as hemostate. Okay. So. That's <coughs> the pathology, Dr. Farsa. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm Dr. Hussam Abu Farsakh. Uh, before we start, uh, we'd like to congratulate Dr. Ibrahim Speh on graduation of his son from Georgetown University, uh, Aziz. Can you stand, Aziz? Can you start before? He graduated from politics and uh, finance this year. Uh, His fiance. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I don't know what this. Fiance, please stand up. Gabby <laughs> is from Spain and she's fiance of Aziz and my daughter, Russia. Mm -hmm. 
uh, before we talk about TB, I'd like to, to tell you that uh, as a pathologist, uh, I see TB uh, in many organs, uh, not the brain. The brain probably is the least that we see. Uh, because I do a lot of fine needle respiration, uh, I see TB not infrequently in the lymph nodes, the cervical lymph nodes. And the most common scenario in these patients usually is a housemaid uh, that works in Jordan, usually from Southeast Asia. And uh, it's not uncommon to see in large lymph nodes that refer to me suspected of lymphoma. And it's very common to see TB uh, in this uh, lymphadenitis. And the most common question uh, usually asked by me uh, in these cases, is this infectious to the kids? Because most of these housemates care for the kids. Uh, usually this is not infectious in the same degree as open or pulmonary TB. Probably Dr. Montasek can tell that. The other one that also many people, they don't know about TB. Uh, in Jordan, I see about four to five cases a year of TB in the breast. And usually these cases present as a breast mass and one caution, when the surgeon usually opens these cases, not send them to, to find needle, the scar that is opened will, will be become discharging and an ugly scar after TB. This is one thing that can tell you this, but when you refer to me that this is, is a TB, because the scar of TB never heals, and when it heals, it heals really after uh, a bad uh, uh, repair. Uh, let's go to our case. This is a case that uh, we saw uh, many granulomatous diseases. We, we called it uh, multiple non caseating granuloma. You know TB is known for its caseating granuloma, but also TB can cause non caseating granulomas, especially if it is milliard TB. So don't wait for caseation to call it TB. Many TB cases that we see are not really non caseating granulomas. This is, you can see the granulomas. Uh, this is a cerebellar tissue, and there are three granulomas in here. Uh, one of them uh, near the blood vessel. You can see it more. You can see this is the granulomatous disease. This is miliar, typical miliary TB granulomas. Uh, lymphocytes, and these are uh, histocytes with many giant cells. You can see, you can see some giant cells, and these are the histocytes. The histocytes usually become in whirling pattern. And you can see this is cerebellar tissue, you can tell. And this is granuloma in here and granuloma in here. And this is cerebellar tissue. So we know we are in the cerebellar, cerebellar tissue. And all these are granulomas, multiple granulomas, many, many of them. Uh, some of them, they are really around blood vessels. Uh, this makes you to think of other differential. I think always pathologists, when they diagnose a case, always have to think what really it could be else. This is a granuloma around blood vessel. You always have to ask yourself, is this a granulomatous? Uh, vasculitis or this is a granuloma secondary to TB because TB granulomas can be around blood vessels but also other granulomatous diseases like Wegener's or uh, uh, church strobus or other things can be around blood vessels. You can see here the blood vessels and here's the granuloma around it. Uh, this is the multinucleated giant cells. The giant cells that are present in TB, we call them Langhans type giant cells. The nuclei are usually spread at the periphery of the nucleus. Uh, many, many nuclei together, merged together, and form large cells, and these, the uh, periphery are formed by Langhans type germ cells, in contrary to the foreign body giant cells, which usually the nuclei are scattered all over the giant cells, not in one line, as in Langhans giant cells. Uh, we did Zir Nelson uh, uh, for this case. Zir Nelson was negative. Uh, I warn you, don't dismiss TB if Zir Nelson is negative, because really Zir Nelson, in my, ha in my hand and many other people's hands, I think uh, it's less than 10%, uh, especially in miliary TB. Uh, we do also, we, when there is granuloma, we have to do all our infectious stains work up. We do uh, GMS stain, glomerulonephrine, silver stain, this is for fungi. We do BS stain, this is for fun, fungi and parasites. We do, do GAMS stain for parasites. So we work up all, everything uh, for uh, to, to call it uh, whether organisms are seen or not seen. And this is really, usually is really very, a uh, tremendous work when the pathologist has to spend looking for or searching for Zemnusin stain. Probably one slide will take him one hour to search or for Zemnusin stains. It's not an easy task uh, to look for Zemnusin stain. So we call this case uh, as a, a granulomatous lung disease. Uh, we advise to do some stain. This is a test, adenosine DMNAs, and some other tests uh, for TB. Uh, <coughs> 
We have a new test, uh, uh, not interferon, we call it T-spot or oleospot test. Actual oleospot test is more common in Britain than in the uh, in United States. Interferon is more, I have in my lab the oleospot test, which is very, very good test, really to uh, look for activity. So this is granulomatous lung disease, granulomatous brain, brain disease. Uh, is Dr. Bijani around? I've seen him. No, he's here. Okay. So the best operative course, the patient was uh, awake on table. We don't allow patients to go on ventilators. They must get awake on table. No one should leave theater unless they are awake. They are not awake, there's a problem, and we need to know it there and there. So we do also the brain MRI the very following day. Even if we finish at 3 a.m., the following morning at 7 a.m., he must have the MRI. So that's the MRI. That's where we are. PCR yes, it was negative. PCR. Yeah. So these are the ones that Dr. Sampras have asked for. The serum adenosine negative, TBA60 negative. Dr. Montessar Balbisi asked for serum TB24 and sarcoidosis enzymes, and they turned out to be normal. And retention was normal for sarcoidosis. So we started the treatment uh, on the basis of the histology uh, that this is a granuloma and this patient is coming from Yemen and he was started on the treatment as in nasal, defibrillation, alizomide and hypofluxus. This was for two months and then this was for one year. I used nasal, defibrillation and vitamin B6. Patient was doing well and he was discharged in the seventh post-operative day. This is him. Showed you that he has full eye movements, that he was mobilized immediately after surgery. And uh, this is our uh, famous by now uh, discharge summary, made of 15, 20 pages, whatever, telling everything about the patient, everything we have done, pictures, everything. This is full up in the clinic. Again, he's doing well, and this is his. Full of MRI, six months, almost cured. No hydrocephalus, fourth ventricle is opening up, so the venom is okay. And this is one year for life. Again, no trace of the disease. So it's a learning the process that we uh, take from the day we are born to the day we are dying for thousands of years. If you stop learning, you will be uh, missed. Thank you very much. <laughs> and the next any questions? Please. Uh, this case, you said that the uh, stain was negative, contoporone just negative, and PCR is negative, yes? And you put the patient on anti-TB medication. So how do you diagnose it? Because this is a granuloma from Yemen, or is most likely, and I leave this to Montessor to answer. Yeah, Dr. Montessor, if you remember, we had a case like this where all the test was negative. One patient I sent it to you. Okay, but and Dr. Hussain said that this patient has a granuloma, a granulomatous disease, but I can't say it's a TB. Yes. You put the patient on anti TB or, or when where oral test is needed. Yes. This is the problem with TB. How do you really diagnose it? Um, oftentimes, these uh, um, uh, smears and PCR are not sensitive enough. Um, based on the clinical presentation, based on the actual um, non caseating granuloma described by uh, Dr. Far Abu Farsah. Based on the fact that this is a Yemeni patient where uh, TB is endemic uh, in Yemen, um, and there's an old adage, there's an old pro. If you ever think of a cranial TB treated, that's what we, uh, our uh, professors used to teach us. And so we opted to treat this patient. I, there was a very high likelihood that this is what he had. Um, and you cannot always rely on it, but what else could it have been? 
um, if it was sarcoid, uh, you know, um, would not have responded to anti-TB medications. Um, and maybe it's uh, multi-drug resistant, and we're not diagnosed. Okay? Now, so in, more worse. right, you would have to continue to follow the patient up clinically uh, very closely. Uh, if this was MDR, then you might expect a relapse uh, or a regrowth of the uh, Possibly another, another relapse. Yes. Okay, Dr. Jalil, have you seen TB meningitis in children? In children? Uh, not in the past 20 years. Myself, I did not see, but we used to see before. So not in the last 20 years? No, I did not see. Uh, they might go to uh, some other doctors, but myself, I did not see. But we do give the PCG early, as you said, we used to see uh, TB meningitis in children. This is our our most uh, worry you now. But of course, anybody that comes from the neighborhood and uh, uh, they have cough and so on, we do test for TB, but I did not see myself except the meningitis. Did I send you any patient like that and I forgot? Montasser? No. No, I was going to uh, to add, um, now that you mentioned that they might go elsewhere, uh, there is in Mafrach a TB sanatorium, Masah uh, uh, Nur, and uh, it's under the auspices of an American uh, charity group. Um, and they have uh, drugs for uh, uh, MDR TB, they have uh, better diagnostic uh, capabilities, including PCR. Uh, and so uh, a lot of people might go to them, uh, yes, like you alluded yeah, to. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. It exists, but I, yeah, in my clinic, I did not. Okay. But we really worry about meningitis in children, and that's why we keep on, although the BCG is not the best, but it keeps us more at ease. So BCG is good, but it does not... Uh, as, you, as it was said, one year of age, and this is the time that they are, the immunity is very low. So, Junaid, have you seen TB enteritis? Or? Yes, we, I have seen uh, peritonitis, and it kind of presents, uh, there are two ways where it would present. It's called the dry abdomen and the wet abdomen. And they have the dry abdomen, which you call the doughy abdomen. And you do the uh, uh, laparoscopy, and you would see all the TB and miliary type of TB involving the old visceral uh, postprandial and the uh, viscera also involved in that. And uh, they do well on uh, antituberculous therapy after that. Dr. Yeah. Uh, Anwar, any uh, I just comment one more thing that uh, mentioning about the helpers of home that come from South Asia. We have a lot of panic that comes to families once a week at least when uh, all the, these helpers should have been examined well, and they would suddenly find after one year that they had something, you know, an old TB, and it would be the scare of their life. This is what we are about, Shadi. Thank you. Dr. Anwar is a senior pathologist. I have seen TB in, uh, you know, because we used to do all the uh, uh, routine, uh, all the passion. X-rays. We use, we saw TB in the bones, in the spine, and um, in uh, I, in my practice in uh, uh, mammography, I saw in the uh, in uh, Filipino uh, maids TB in the breast, and I saw one TB in the breast in uh, Jordanian, and sometimes they they present as if it is. Uh, any, any, they may mimic anything, like uh, heart failure, like anything. And uh, too much we used to see in the chest because we used to, uh, to do surveys when the uh, Makanti Tajmeet and we had uh, people coming. We, we saw small uh, micro films or small films and we used to pick up a lot of TV. For military service, uh, for military service sure, sure. Uh, we picked up a lot of TV. Now we are seeing in Syrians, sure. actually. Sure. Thank you. Uh, yeah, hi. Thank you so much for Can this. Can you introduce um, yourself? Okay, introduce myself. Thank you so much for this amazing okay. picture. I'm Rani Obasamra, uh, consultant in uh, pediatric respiratory mm -hmm. from King's Kings. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
Um, right, I, I'm, I'm Rania Osamra, a consultant in respiratory pediatric from King's College Hospital, London. And to, uh, from next week, I'm going to join Farah as one of the, the consultants in Farah, hopefully. Thank you so much. Um, I, uh, well, I've got quite experience with tuberculosis in the children. And all of the cases I've seen in England, they're either uh, Indian immigrants from Asia, African as well, and actually the worst were the one from Romania and Ukraine, the one with the MDR. Uh, one of the cases as well was congenital TB, which is quite rare, and we uh, published that case as well. Um, in terms of uh, uh, CNS uh, TB, yes, we had one of the uh, 12, 13, 13 years old girl who presented with a tubercoloma and pericarditis. Actually, we didn't pick the tubercoloma, we, we picked the pericarditis and she had some malar rash. We thought it's SLE, we got so excited, we gave her steroid and then she ended up with tubercoloma. So she had like uh, anti TB treatment for uh, 18 months, but she recovered really fully. The interesting thing with children with tuberculosis is that they recover really well with TB treatment, uh, most of them. Um, even the one with horrendous chest x-ray and chest CT, they cover almost um, completely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any comments, anything from the audience, please? Yeah, I guess I want to uh, just look at what to say. I was actually in the camera that's in the uh, LA hospital. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. My name is Samir Risha. I was in the hospital uh, in Abu Dhabi and now I'm in Jordan back again. Actually, Dr. Montasir is so much worried about the idea. And hopefully, you're joining us. Yes. Hopefully, hopefully. Dr. Montasir is so much worried about the idea and sensitivity of TB actually in, in Amaris in Abu Dhabi. And in Abu Dhabi, there are two main reference labs for idea and sensitivity where you can get the microbacteria up to species and you can get a full sensitivity test. This will be very helpful in Jordan. We can do this actually. Nowadays, there is a midget machine, and there are some other, I mean, like Vitek, that can help in for idea sensitivity of TB. That's what I'm saying. It can be done here very easily. And what's the turnaround time? For well, the result? like 24 hours only. 24 hours. Yes, 24 hours. Yeah. That's yeah, yeah. That's it. So that we can start the year. Dr. Khalid, spending some time in USA, have you seen cases of CNS TB? No, I haven't. Yeah, but anybody in, from USA has seen cases of? Uh, CNS TV. Okay, any more questions or comments, please? So, the SLM is the patient is Use of steroids in tuberculosis is controversial. But the tide is towards using it rather than not using it. As you know, one of the complications of steroids is that it flares up infection. So it is said that if you give it to TB to flare up the infection, but most of the people feel that the edema and the well-being when the rose is good for the steroids. So use it as long as you need, so long that you don't have complications. But usually it is for a few weeks time. And we had a slide in my talk on that. Yes, you did. You did. Uh, Any more questions or comments? Yes. Uh, I want to ask uh, last question. Last question. Last question. First one. Okay. Uh, many of these cases, the surgeon will not know uh, this TV before operation. Yeah. So, in work in tuberculosis, does the staff in the operating room and the surgeon uh, exposed or yeah, consider as exposed to TB and need? Uh, some prophylactic antibiotic. This is the first thing. So, if you aerosolize these uh, microbacteria, you are at risk of catching it. If you have any inclination of the CPTB, it's preferable to wear N95 masks. Um, does this mean we won't lose some prophylactic antibiotics or we we'll do some tests for the staff? Not really. No, no. Not really. The second Open question. Open cavitary TB is a lot more contagious. Sure. Uh, sure. Uh, much yeah. of this is. Uh, I'm going to ask our colleague, Shoy. Yes. Second question. What about this line? This communication against yes, the virus. Yes, this is this question for what? Okay. Because yeah, yeah. 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 in case of spine instability, okay, when if in case of spine instability due to what's the case? We need to uh, to reconstruct the spine in way or okay. Now use the 
instrumentation in the presence of TB or pyogenic abscess that lead to instability. We learned that don't use instrumentation because of the friction and it will become resistant. You will not okay, so the question about instrumentation is to Excellent question, actually, and I was expecting somebody to ask about it. Um, in 1998, um, I have been in Istanbul for I mean, Turkish um, Swine Society meeting, and there was a full symposium about that. Um, at the beginning, they said, I mean, that, uh, or let us say, the classical rule that don't put the uh, uh, implants uh, in any case of infection, even like I mean, when you are talking about uh, fracture femur and, uh, and so on and so on, you have to remove even the implants, okay, when there is infection after operations or something like that. But they found that I mean, from series of uh, cases and um, uh, a lot of research about that, I mean, unless you stabilize the spine, the infection will not improve. So we went a step forward that, as you see in some cases, these are all old cases that, I mean, we go anterior, remove the whole pathology, vertebra, discs, and so on, and uh, drain the abscess and clean and so on, send it to the culture, and of course, we give antibiotic immediately during the operation, and go from posterior, clean area, we put the uh, stabilizing process. But actually, we found that after some time, I mean, recently, we remove everything and we put cage from anterior and all from anterior. Sometimes we put in a um, cage and uh, plate house, yes. and networks from anterior. And you could not find any difference in the results. And when you, but this is conditioned by removal of all the pathological tissues, the vertebra, the discs, and the uh, before we go, lots of you congratulated me for the success of my son. So I'd like to call upon him so that you can congratulate him personally. As he is getting. <laughs> 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 Ha, 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 ha,